On the surface, friction seems like a pretty straightforward idea. Two surfaces are in contact, and because of the particles near the edges of those surfaces, there is a resulting force when they move past each other. Take our box. It's just sitting there, not moving. So if the box is not moving, and there is no force trying to make it move, then there must be no frictional force acting on the book. But what happens if you give that box a little push? Not enough to move it, but enough to know that you have applied a force. The box still doesn't move. Why not? If we draw a free body diagram for this box, we know that there is gravity acting downward and a normal force acting upward with the same magnitude. We know this because there is no vertical motion, so those two forces must be balancing each other. You are applying a force to the right, so there must be some force pushing in the opposite direction with an equal magnitude. How do we know this? Well, the net force acting on an object is equal to the mass times the acceleration. If our box is not moving, then there cannot be an acceleration, which means that our net force is zero. So if we are applying a force to the right, then there has to be an equal force acting to the left. So as long as we are pushing on the box and it is not moving, there is an equal and opposite frictional force that keeps it from moving. Keep in mind that if we stop pushing, the friction goes away. If we push a little harder and the box does not move, the static friction force balances the applied force. What if we give it a bigger push? As long as the box does not move, the friction will increase at the same rate as the applied force. We refer to frictional forces as non-conservative forces because they will increase to a certain point, but never exceed the applied force in the opposite direction. So since the object is still not moving, we call this frictional force the static friction. Static literally means no change, so the static friction force is keeping the object from changing its position. Now eventually we might be able to push our box hard enough for the static friction to lose out and not be able to balance the applied force. What will happen to the box then? It will start to move. So there is some maximum value at which the static force is overcome. We can state this as an inequality with respect to some constant. We can say that the force of static friction is less than or equal to the constant called mu s times the normal force. We can also describe this as the maximum static force equal to mu s times the normal force. Now once the box starts to move, the static friction coefficient does not apply. But as long as the box stays put, we can say that the maximum frictional force is equal to the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. Now there are in fact two coefficients of friction. Mu s refers to the coefficient of static friction. Essentially, we can say that mu s, or mu static, is the amount of force that it takes to get an object moving. As soon as the object starts to move, we need to refer to the coefficient of kinetic friction. Kinetic means motion, so this constant is used when an object is in motion. Now the coefficient of static friction typically is not equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction. Actually, the static friction is usually less than the kinetic friction. If you've ever moved a heavy object, you probably noticed that once you get up moving, it seemed a lot easier to push. So mu kinetic is the force that it is required to keep an object moving. We can determine the minimum amount of force needed to keep an object in motion in the same way we determined how to get it started. It again depends on the surfaces involved, which is described by mu k, and it also depends on the normal force. So the magnitude of kinetic friction, or the minimum amount of force required to keep an object in motion, is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction for the two surfaces times the normal force of the object. Table 5.1 in your book gives a few different coefficients of static and kinetic friction. Take a look at the shoes on wood. The static coefficient is 0.9. That is pretty high and is actually what allows you to get your body moving when you take a step. Now look at the coefficient for shoes on ice. It is 0.1, which is significantly lower than the shoes on wood. This is probably something that is apparent to you if you've ever experienced wintertime. You know that it is more difficult to walk on ice than it is on wood because there is less friction between your foot and the surface. So how much force is required to start... Ooh.
how much force does is, how much force is required to start a 95 kilogram wooden crate moving across a metal table. We are given the mass of the crate, which we need in order to find the normal force. And looking at our table, we see that the coefficient of static friction for wood moving along metal is 0 0.5. So we would need to apply 4.66 newtons of force to the crate in order to give it moving across the metal floor. Now how much force is it going to take to keep it moving? Well, the only difference in these two problems is that the first one, we were starting the crate moving, and the second, the crate was already in motion. So the coefficient for the kinetic friction for wood moving across a metal surface is 0 0.3. So substituting that constant gives us a force of 279 newtons. So let's add in angles. Consider a 62 kilogram skier on a 25 degree slope. If the friction is found to be 45 newtons, what is the coefficient of friction between the skis and the snow? Well, the gravitational force is pulling the skier vertically downwards towards the center of the earth. The ground is also pushing back up on the skier with a normal force in a direction perpendicular to the ground. Of course, there is also a force acting to pull the skier down the slope as well. And remember that this force will be the x component of the gravitational force. You can probably imagine there will also be a frictional force acting to oppose the movement and will act in the opposite direction along the slope. So we can represent this as a free body diagram. This lets us resolve our component vectors a little more cleanly and see what it is we need to find. Our question is asking us to find the coefficient of friction. So we need to determine the magnitude of the frictional force and the magnitude of the normal force. Remember we can rotate our coordinate system so that the x-axis follows along the direction of motion. The force of gravity does not act in any of these directions that we have defined in our coordinate system, so it is acting at an angle to the direction of motion. This means we need to break it into its components. If we extend our coordinate system down to include our gravity vector, we can draw an x component for our gravity vector and a y component for our gravity vector. Now FGY is the same magnitude as normal force pushing up on the skier from the surface. So we can determine the magnitude of the normal force by finding the magnitude of the Y component for a gravitational force. Taking our weight by the cosine of 25, we get a normal force of 551 newtons. This we can plug into our kinetic friction equation. The force of friction was given to us at 45 newtons. So dividing the frictional force by the normal force gives us a coefficient of friction of 0 0.082.